Um, this contribution aims to explore a relational approach to fishing in the late Mesolithic Stone Age of Norway. Within Scandinavian Mesolithic research, fishing has gained little attention beyond its importance in the foraging economy. And even the novel fields of multi-species archaeology and so on are mainly focused on furry and feathery animals. Norway has a lot of coasts, and this map shows all the Stone Age sites in southern Norway currently registered in our nas national database. And it clearly demonstrates the importance of the waterways, and in particular the coast for hunter-gatherer settlements throughout the Stone Age. The time frame that I will be talking about today uh, is approximately 6,300 to 3,800 calib calibrated BC. And in most of Europe, coastal sites from this period are flooded by the post-glacial Holocene sea level rise and are now located below, be, below present sea level. But in large parts of Norway, rapid deglaciation and continuous isostatic uplift has resulted in elevated shorelines. So here, the former coastal occupancies are preserved on dry land. And the location of sites occurring occurrence of fishing equipment and faunal fish remains all point to the dietary importance of fish, leaving aside the problem of quantifying fish remains. For now, uh, cod and sape are the most common species in Mesolithic coastal fisheries. These are species which could be fished close to the shore with small fish hooks, which is also the most common type of hook that are found on the sites. And of course, uh, cod and sate do not have these colors. But the drawings were so cute, so I just couldn't uh, help myself to put them in. Fishing was also important in the interior areas of Norway. Following the deglaciation, Around 8,500 BC, trout, pike, and perch populated the newly emerged land masses in the interior of Norway along the watercourses from the south and as well as from the Baltic Sea to the east. But uh, as is visualized on this figure, steep elevation and a lot of waterfalls in these rivers prevented fish to naturally migrate all the way up to the mountains. DNA analysis of current trout populations in Norway in the Norwegian mountains, that are in the Norwegian mountains today, they show a continental ancestry. And as uh, our recent investigations date the earliest finds of trout to the late Mesolithic, this probably means that living trout was actually transported up here by humans 6,000 years ago, indicating a fish-human relations that were rather more complex than previously assumed. But how do we identify relations in the archaeological record when the evidence is fragmented and widely distributed in time and space? In my research, I've tried to solve this by focusing on material remains that are unique to Norway and by limiting my study to the Malate Mesolithic. But this archaeological phase also stretches over 2,000 years and comprise sites that are not really directly related. And so, to connect these various sites and independent phenomena in a meaningful way, I've found it most suitable to apply a generalized model. So I've been uh, using the model of animism as an analytical framework for approaching human-fish relations in early prehistory, as opposed to the usual optimization models. I based my understanding of animism on the ontological model of Philippe Discola, which we have heard about earlier today, and which I suppose that most of you are familiar with. Discola follows Levi-Strauss by stressing broad ethnographic comparison and asserts that behind the apparent diversity in which people relate to animals, there are limited ways of conceptually ordering these relations. Human beings relate to others by self-comparison, which is variously focused on outer form and inner essence. And it distinguishes four main ontologies, which are animism, totemism, analogism, and naturalism. 
Of course, these ontological models they are ideal types. They are theoretical models used for ordering a very complex empirical reality. And therefore, I think they are very useful as our heuristic devices. Archaeology is often presented as the discipline par excellence for exploring a deep historical perspective. And as such, archaeology has the capacity to study long-term historical structures, including the condition and changes of human-animal relations. But as far as I've seen, most works which advance a relational, a relational understanding fail to acknowledge the temporal depth in the, in the archaeological record, and therefore also to, to the t detect the dynamics of long-term structures. So this implies that I think of ontology in terms of the historically conditioned ways through which humans apprehend reality, rather than ontology as the study of reality being or becoming. It's been, it's been argued that this position makes ontology rather similar to culture. But this is a position I find quite compatible with prehistoric archaeology. And following Descola, I've interpreted the Mesolithic view of animals as sociocentric, implying a, world, a view of reality whereby sociality and agency is extended to non-humans and sometimes also to objects. By taking such an ideal model as a starting point, the chance of identifying a type of relation unique to a prehistoric context may be lowered. But on the other hand, if the, if the archaeological material manifests relations which are completely unknown and um, unheard of in any known human society, then how will we be able to recognize these? I think it's also important that Descola stresses that no society or culture actualizes any ontological mode exclusively. One mode commonly dominates and is linked to the everyday practice and social structures. But all observable societies may contain elements of various modes of identification. So this opens for considering the presence of parallel modes or impacts of different ontological modes within phases based on the particular archaeological record. So by combining a structural model uh, with a holistic and bottom-up approach by exploration of, the, of specific case studies, we might be able to discern context-specific and partic particular ways in which people of a given time period related to the animal world. So I will return to uh, the archaeological material in a bit and argue that the large number of Mesolithic sites investigated in Norway, hundreds, gives the impression of long-time reg regional stability and regularity rather than extreme variability. <coughs> In Norway, rock art supplements the sites and the formal records and gives us a fascinating glimpse into the symbolic world of the Mesolithic. These images, of course, they do not give us any direct access into past symbolic meaning. But I think recurrent motives are important because they point to themes and relations that occupy the minds of Mesolithic people. So we'll come back to halibut imagery is one such recurring topic. Within the animal turn, it has been claimed that symbolic approaches devaluate animals by reducing them to containers for human symbolism. And it has become a truism that animals play active roles in intersubject, intersubjective relations. The ideas of intersubjectivity and mutual becomings, I think they're very important and offer interesting perspectives and insights into human animal engagements in general. But they're often difficult to demonstrate archaeologically. So therefore, I don't think we should uh, throw symbolism out with the bathwater. And central to my arguments have been that the symbolic world of animists follow the logic of the concrete and is linked with animal etiology and real life experiences. So what was on the mind of uh, Mesolithic people, uh, animals? Animals are the recurring motive uh, in uh, the Mesolithic rock art. This uh, uh, rock art is uh, almost always connected to water. But despite this, uh, fish imagery is very exceptional. 
It is elk, reindeer, and red deer, which are the most frequently depicted animals. And no representation of cod or saith has ever been identified. The majority of the representations are interpreted as halibut, uh, a species which uh, hardly ever occur in the faunal assemblages. Halibut is the largest fish occurring along the Norwegian coast. It's a predatory species which spends most of its adult life in the deep sea. Still, rock art imag imagery often display halibut as hooked on a line, and it can also be, uh, take, it, it can also be harpooned, as this picture is showing. I will um, give some examples. Here are uh, several halibut representations from Alta in northern Norway. And we see a halibut fishing scene from Forshelv in Trøndelag. So, using a relational framework, uh, I've interpreted these halibut fishing scenes as representing one type of individual relation with a species which was extraordinary, possibly rather infrequently encountered, dangerous and really hard to catch. It was perhaps even considered a being, in, a, a being with agency, and maybe even a person. Among animists, personhood is not described to all animate beings. This term is commonly received, used just for principal species of prey, and for predatory mammals like the bear. But the halibut is actually depicted alongside these species. Oh. No, 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 that picture has gone out. Oh, no. Sorry. <laughs> the really coolest picture. Uh, um, it's showing uh, uh, people fishing from a boat, uh, and it's a halibut beside an a elk or a bear or a belk. It's a bit uh, difficult to say. Uh, um, so, um, in a paper that uh, came out last year, I suggested that the uh, fish hooks are also key objects for exploring the worldviews of Mesolithic group, Mesolithic coastal groups. Because this focus on uh, the fishing activity that we see on these images, rather than just the fish itself, this opens for exploring the, uh, the, the extension of agency to objects. As materiality is a very central medium for reproducing worldviews in non-literate societies, because abstract thinking requires material objects for its symbolizations. And among animists, animal body parts are often believed to have intrinsic powers that, act that constitute an activating agency. And the tangible qualities of animal hard parts are often associated with cosmological realms and cosmographic environments. Uh, at the moment, I'm working with um, experiments uh, making fish hooks. And these experiments show that uh, bone and antler from elk, red deer, and reindeer were used for making fish hooks in the Mesolith in Mesolithic Norway. So even though these prehistoric populations mainly subsided on fish, their fishhook manufacture was entangled with the hunting of ungulates that provided the raw material and the transformation of these animals into artifacts. And following from this, I've suggested that these bone fishhooks were animated by their ungulate origins. Fishhooks even occur occasionally in the rock art. Here we see the Medbo panel from uh, uh, Western Sweden, where a fish hook, we can see it here in the middle, is associated with a fish or marine mammal uh, and several ungulates, most probably elks. Another, oh, here it is. Here is the, uh, the one with the, the belk, yes. Uh, another recurring motive in the late Scandinavian rock art, which uh, combine ungulates uh, and the aquatic environment, are the elk-headed boats that we see them on the top here. And we could perhaps also uh, include the category uh, termed deer-head poles, because rock art was not necessarily made to be seen from below, like up on a canvas. Uh, a lot of these 
uh, images are made on flat surfaces or even uh, under things. They were meant to be seen from various angles, uh, or maybe even from above. So if we turn this upside down, the deer head poles actually resemble fish hooks. Okay, it's maybe a little bit far-fetched. I'm not going to pursue this interpretation more <laughs> anymore now, uh, but I will return uh, to the fish. The most astonishing fist representation, I think, uh, is a Kvennavika panel, which depicts 15 flat fishes arranged in a semicircle. These fishes have been considered to be halibuts uh, in line with uh, the previous Im images I've just shown you. But during historical times, place, which is a smaller species of, of flat fish, was extremely numerous in this area. And even today, fishing for place is forbidden in the spawning season to protect it from over, over exploitation. <coughs> place and flounder are also more common in the faunal records. So, based on place etiology in this particular location, Quenavica could perhaps be interpreted as an ag aggregation site for spawning place. During spawning, people, Mesolithic people may have related to flat fishes in terms of mass harvest, rather than as individuals or persons. In the northern regions, animal seasonality is crucial for subsistence. And ethnographic as well as historical accounts point to the need for communal cooperation in seasonal harvesting, making it also a very socially charged event. In animist societies, Antagonism commonly revolves around the death and regeneration of humans and animals. And the depiction may concern society's collective efforts, which were essential in securing the rebirth of new fish. So while both place and halibut are flat fishes, the characteristics and behaviors led to different fishing methods. And I've suggested that angling for singular big fish differed conceptually from the mass harvest of large schools of anonymous fish. <coughs> So, as uh, demonstrated by these examples, uh, a relational approach to fishing may entail different types of practical, symbolic, and social engagement. May have included killing and eating, perhaps regulating and manipulating, and also even caring and cultivating of local fish species. And, to paraphrase Levi Strauss, while most fish were good to eat, only some, like the flat fishes, were also good to think. Thank you.